if you want to understand power, you have to understand who nominates candidates, not understand who votes for candidates. Our system is not a democracy. The percentage of our population that participates in the nomination process is literally less than 5% of the population. And really, less than 1% of the population. If I was in control of the nominating process of everything that everybody ate, and I always nominated cheeseburgers or fried chicken, and I told you that it was a democracy and you could eat anything you want, as long as it was a cheeseburger or fried chicken. Would that be a democracy? I could sell it to you as a democracy because I don't decide whether you eat cheeseburgers or fried chicken. You get to vote in a very large and well-publicized election as to whether we're going with fried chicken or cheeseburgers. And people organize into very tribal groups, be very anti-fried chicken and very pro-cheeseburger, or they'll explain to you exactly why cheeseburgers are going to be the end of the world and why fried chicken's going to save you. Those who can afford it hire lobbyists who essentially buy politicians. Most of the time, either party will suit their needs. Definition of a lobbyist in the United States is someone who advocates for someone else and is getting paid for it. The laws then enacted are quite often written by the corporations to benefit themselves. Professor Thurber sees an underground explosion in lobbying and estimates the industry actually brings in more than $9 billion a year, exceeded only by tourism and government. The reason that we aren't changing things right now is the banks have lobbyists in Washington in numbers I've never seen. Lobbyists are strictly there to buy access. They are not there to enhance the democratic process. Families and working people just don't have that kind of representation, power, or influence to look after their needs. They've designed the system uh, to reinforce and, in a sense, uh, finance themselves based off of special interests. Everything that was around in 2007, 2008, that we get so scared about, the mortgage-backed securities, the credit default swaps, the other derivatives, they still exist. They absolutely do. And yes, there's higher capital requirements for the banks, so they can't be as leveraged, but those are not that high. And if we don't have a media that's providing who's really like writing these bills and passing this legislation and what it's all for and who it serves, then we're living in a false, we're living in an illusion. Well, I think that generally the laws in this country are written by the wealthy and the powerful because I mean, I think by definition, that's who controls the legislatures and the commanding heights of uh, the power system in this country. And that's a scary reality because you can pay your way into having laws implemented that serve you and your corporation as, as you would like them to serve. The complete impunity that corporations have to operate unabated and pollute the entire planet. A major spill of toxic coal ash is raising questions again about the safety of water and the government regulators overseeing industry. There's zero accountability. I mean, other than slap on the wrist of a couple fines here and then, I mean, slave labor, to the exploitation of resources on the planet. The slap on the wrist of industries that pollute, cut corners, and violate policies will continue as long as it's profitable to do so. JP Morgan paid 13 billion in fines last year. If you have that much money in order to just pay fines, and they put away 19 billion for paying fines. JP Morgan is paying $410 million to settle charges with the government, but JP Morgan is not admitting any wrongdoing. Goldman Sachs settled early on in this case for $550 million without admitting wrongdoing. UBS has agreed to pay about $50 million under the terms of the settlement. UBS did not admit any wrongdoing. Well, I think that people commit the crimes that they're in a social position to commit. I, I think it was Bertolt Brecht that asked, which is a greater crime, to rob a bank or to own one? And I think as we've seen from everything from the savings and loan scandals to the Wall Street meltdown, it's that all too often the owners of the banks are frequently looting the institutions that employ them. Uh, they commit all manner of illegal acts, and yet they're very rarely prosecuted for them. And throughout history, there's been very little, I think, pretense that the government has always acted as an agent for the wealthy class. Yes, there might be idealistic politicians that got into the game to change the world, but 
if they're good, any good at their job, they're no longer changing the world. They're serving the interests of their donors if they want to rise in, in the world of politics. They say, write your congressman. Who the hell is this jackass that you have to write? He should be at the forefront of technology and knowledge. You don't have to write him. I'm sure most of you have flown in airliners. You don't have to write the pilot saying you're flying at an angle. Straighten out, God damn it. He knows his business, that's how he got the job. The people in Washington are lawyers and businessmen and can solve no problems. If the bottom line and it's a profit-driven world, then those interests are gonna be served first and everything is going to be secondary. And, and that's the sad reality of it. There is no value system that's put out there that is actually beneficial to humanity because it's based on consumerism and profit making. And we use artificial pumping in animals to make them grow faster. So if you can multiply the cells in the chicken faster, you, you can sell it sooner. But does that have an effect on the human body? They don't worry about it. They worry about the sale of chickens.